Okay, I think we're about ready to get started. Um, am I on here? Yes? Okay. Yeah, everyone can hear me. Uh, so welcome to the Brown Bag series of the Office for History of Science and Technology and also the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. Uh, my name is Mary Sunderland. I'm a postdoc here and I help to organize uh, this series. So if you're interested in participating in uh, future events, feel free to contact me about that. We are very fortunate today uh, to have a talk by Ozzy Zayner. Um, here at the, during this Brown Bag series, we hear a variety of works. Some are more in progress than others. And today, we are fortunate to be hearing a very polished talk uh, based on an already, well, we have an advanced copy here, so I'd say it's already published, but it doesn't officially come out until June 1st. So we're going to be hearing um, sort of the, the talk for Ozzy's book titled Green Illusions. Um, the title for today's talk is Solar Cells and Other Fairy Tales. Um, Ozzy's looking for you know, a variety of feedback today. Some feedback he's especially interested in, and he's circulated feedback cards. Um, so if you could fill out the feedback cards, we are going to have a little draw at the end of today's talk, uh, with one lucky winner winning an advanced copy of the book. Uh, so there's an incentive to fill out those cards. Um, Ozzy's been a visiting scholar here for a few years, and he will be here indefinitely. He has a f at least a few, <laughs> at least a few books uh, on the go, so he seems to turn them out rather quickly. But perhaps we'll be able to convince him to stay a little bit longer. Um, he his background is in engineering, where he studied um, at Kettering University and went on to do some advanced work in science and technology studies at the University of Amsterdam. Um, his, he's going to be starting on a book tour. Uh, he's going to tour 19 cities uh, internationally, including the US. Uh, and so we're going to hear sort of an advanced version of, of the talk. And he wanted me to highlight that this talk is meant for a general audience. And often during these sessions, we, we listen to talks that are not meant for a general audience, but really for a very specialized audience. And so I think this is a really great opportunity for us uh, to think about how to communicate with different audiences. Um, what, what works, uh, how to speak with different people, not just in different disciplines, uh, but uh, you know, in different positions. Uh, what else should I mention? Ozzy obviously is a writer, uh, and he not only writes books, but he also publishes uh, in a variety of journals. He has a recent article in the Christian Science Monitor. So with that, I will pass the mic over to Ozzy. Thank you very, uh, very much, Mary. I appreciate it. And many thanks to the UC Berkeley Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society, as well as the uh, UC Berkeley Energy and Resources Collaborative for co-hosting the talk today. It's a pleasure and an honor to speak with all of you here today, as well as those who are tuned in online. I'm planning to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and then take questions, questions about this talk, questions about the book, Green Illusions. And by the way, uh, as Mary mentioned, this is the copy I'll be giving away. It's an advanced copy, so it's a couple drafts old, but it gets most of the point across. Now, keep in mind that, that this is a talk designed for a non-specialist audience. And you may recognize some familiar elements, uh, boundary objects, actor network theory, uh, semiotic theory, and so on. But these terms never come to the surface. I'm going to make four points today. First, that solar cells have side effects and limitations. Second, that while solar energy or solar cells produce a certain amount of electrical power, they also produce something else, and that power is symbolic. Third, I'm going to talk about how that symbolic power has seduced us into doing stupid things. And fourth, I'm going to consider an alternate way of approaching our environmental challenges. Now, if you're a little suspicious about the title of my talk, then all is well. We'll, we will probably get along just fine. And that's because this is not a talk for or against solar energy. I wouldn't dare bludgeon you on the head with a bunch of clean energy facts, when I suspect most people here would be far more interested in the story about how those facts are created and why those facts are valued. I'll begin with a snapshot of what I've found. And I should warn you that some of this is not so pretty to look at, 
Uh, at, at least it wasn't for me. But I do promise you a happy ending. Now you all will be making decisions that will change the built and conceptual environment that we live in. And as such, I suspect you will be answering many of the questions that I am struggling with and will bring up today. The story we lay bare here is far from settled, and I'm hoping that you will help complete it. So let's get started. Once upon a time, a pair of researchers came up with the idea for a new study. Now their study would eventually be published in one of the highest impact journals in their field. They needed a room and participants for their study, and the room that they found was very similar, similar to this one, except on one side it had a, a windows overlooking the ocean with crashing waves and surfers, and then on the other side uh, was a desk with free unlimited coffee. But otherwise it was just like this room. <laughs> and in that room was a table, and on the table was a box. And in the box were items of very little material value. The researchers invited a group of study participants into the room and had them sit around the table. It was a bigger table than this one. And then the researchers assigned the participants one simple task. Now before I can tell you the task, I have to open the box, but before I can open the box, I should tell you a story as to why the contents, the insignificant contents of that box, even matter at all. Years ago, I started a green architecture firm in Washington, D.C. Now, this was before, most of you would know, before the housing market collapsed. Anyway, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And one of my first clients was a diplomat who wanted to live in a solar house. Now, he already had the building. It was a beautiful old house that had seen better days. Now, this was pretty much a dream come true for a young architect, and I was excited about solar cells. I mean, who isn't? I knew that solar cells produced power midday, right when it's needed most. I knew that solar costs were dropping. And I knew that they were a heck of a lot cleaner than coal. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really have a good judge sense for it at that time, but I knew they were cleaner than coal. Now, my client's house was 100 years old. And at about the same time the house was built, someone had planted two oak trees on the western side of the house. By the way, would anyone like to guess why they planted the oak trees there? Uh, some people don't get that, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Well, I have no idea if you're right, because I wasn't there 100 years ago. But I do know that they don't have air conditioning in Washington, D.C., at least 100 years ago they didn't. And in the summer, the wet, swampy air in D.C. just kind of sits there, and it doesn't move. And the last thing that you want to do is add sun to that. And so these trees were great. They shaded the house during the summer. And during the winter, the leaves fell, and the sun could shine through the, through the branches and warm the home's exterior. Now these trees, oh, sorry. Uh, the utility bills for this house with the trees were thousands of dollars less on an annual basis than a new house that was built just down the street. Now these trees surrounding this house had been doing this every year for a hundred years. And as an architect, I was charged with the job of chopping them down. The solar cells demanded it. I mean, you cannot put solar cells on the roof of a shaded house. And as I would soon find out, that was the first of many demands that the solar cells would make. Demand number two is for lots of money. And if you read anything about solar cells these days, you'll be left with the impression that the solar cell cost curve looks something like this. But over the past decade, the installed cost of solar cells actually looks like this. Now, why is there such a discrepancy? There are a lot of reasons, and we will consider some of those later. But part of the reason is because solar proponents are talking about the price of polysilicon and the technical components of solar cells. But polysilicon represents less than a fifth of the total cost of a solar system. Even if the price of polysilicon dropped to zero, you'd still have to pay for the rest. Now, the bulk of solar costs go towards stuff like 
copper, glass, aluminum, fossil fuels, transportation, installation, uh, insurance, things like rare earth metals and heavy metals. Which brings us to the next demand of solar cells. They require some nasty stuff. So, this is what a silicon solar cell looks like before it's packaged inside layers of plastic and glass uh, surrounded with aluminum framing put up on a roof. Now, solar, solar silicon uh, processing involves the use or release of the following chemicals. Phosphine, arsenic, arsenine, trichloroethane, phosphorus oxychloride, ethyl vinyl acetate, silicon trioxide, stannic chloride, tantalium pentoxide, lead, and hexavalent chromium. Even the newer thin film technologies that we see coming online contain cadmium, which is considered an extreme toxin by the EPA. Now what do we do with this at the end of its life? If we incinerate it, that stuff goes into the air, and that's no good. If we bury it, it will inevitably, inevitably end up in the groundwater supply. And none of this stuff biodegrades, leaving us with the same type of predicament that we have with nuclear waste. Now today, solar cell generation is tiny. It supplies less than a hundredth of one percent of our energy needs. This bucket represents U.S. annual consumption on an annual basis. Here's the solar share. If solar cell production grows, so will the associated side effects. But to my dismay, the demands of the solar cells did not stop there. Now, the United Arab Emirates recently conducted one of the largest cross-comparison tests of solar cells to date. They collected a lot of solar cells from a variety of manufacturers, and they intended to find the best manufacturer. But what they did is they drew attention to something else, the disadvantages that all of the solar cells shared in common. Now, a desert might seem like an ideal place to put solar cells. And indeed, it's one of the best, but there were problems. Atmospheric humidity and haze reflected and dispersed the sun sun's rays. Next, there was dust, which technicians had to scrape off almost daily. In other parts of the world, owners deal with bird droppings, shade, leaves, pollution, hail, pollen, ice, snow, and other factors. The third was heat, right in the middle of the day, when the solar cells should have been producing their highest output, they got hot, which cut their output across the board. Now, in addition to all of these effects, solar cells age. Their output fades by about 1% per year. Newer sol solar technologies can actually degrade even more rapidly. But an even larger surprise awaits solar cell owners after about five to ten years, their solar array will suddenly stop producing power. A key component of the solar system, the inverter, will eventually fail. Now this is what an inverter looks like. Solar cells can last 20 to 30 years, but inverters don't. They need to be replaced about two to five times during the productive life of a solar system. Fortunately, just about any licensed electrician can easily swap one out. Unfortunately, each one costs about as much as a new furnace. Incidentally, there's another reason a solar array can stop working. Glenda Hoffman woke up one morning to discover thieves stole 16 panels from her roof as she slept. And in fact, solar thefts are on the rise naturally, nationally. The cost to replace her system chimed in at $95,000, an expense her insurance company covered. Nevertheless, she intends to protect the new panels herself, and this is what she told the New York Times. Now, a lot of people say that these risks are worth it to avoid the greater risks of climate change. Solar power generally yields less CO2 than fossil fuel power. But does this offer a justification for subsidizing solar panels? First, we have to consider cost. Even some of the most expensive options for dealing with CO2, 
would be co become cost competitive long before today's solar technologies, making solar cells seem maybe like a wasteful strategy. Why mitigate one ton of CO2 using solar cells when you could mitigate five or ten tons somewhere else uh, for the same cost? Secondly, solar cell manufacturing releases other types of greenhouse gases. Solar cell manufacturing plants are one of the largest emitters of these three greenhouse gases. Hexafluoroethane, nitrogen trifluoride, and sulfur hexafluoride. These are used to make solar cells, and they make CO2 look harmless. These greenhouse gases are man-made. Man -made. They are 10,000 to 25,000 times more virulent than CO2, according to the IPCC. The solar photovoltaic industry is one of the leading and fastest growing emitters of these gases. Now, I had to explain this to my client. The solar cells demanded that we retrofit the roof. They demanded we purchase locks and insurance. They demanded regular cleaning. They demanded a new inverter every five to ten years. They demanded lots of money. The solar cells demanded an expensive funeral. They demanded to be buried in a specially sealed toxic waste plot. And of course, they demanded that those pesky trees would have to go. Think for a moment, what would you have advised my client to do? Here's how the numbers look. For every $100 that he spent on solar panels, he would produce about this much energy. For every $100 he spent on LED lighting, he would save this much. The value of the trees, added insulation, and efficient appliances would be even greater. In the end, I advised him against a solar installation and instead suggested preserving his oak trees and redirecting the funds toward energy reduction techniques. But he was looking irritated. In fact, he was giving me a grinding look and I said, the trees alone would produce a ten times greater benefit than you'll get from the solar cells even on the sunniest of days and well that didn't help because now he was angry. Certainly I had miscalculated. Or, he implied, I just didn't care about the environment as much as he did. He had already made his decision. The solar cells would stay. And the trees? Well. We've been told that solar cells are clean. We've been promised they will become cheap. And we know that the sun's energy is limitless. We've been seduced by solar cells. And this isn't the first time that this has happened. For generations, our energy bucket has been leaking. The leaks here represent energy waste. In the United States, most energy does nothing productive at all. It just leaks out. But that's not all. This leaky bucket is also getting larger. And that's because we love cheap energy. Politicians subsidize energy production. And when cheap energy is available, of course, more people want more of it, and demand grows. And so it brings us right back to where we started, with high demand and so-called insufficient supply. Now consider hydropower and nuclear power. They were supposed to decrease coal use, but they did not <laughs> quench increasing demand. Demand increases, increased, and the United States met that demand by building more coal-fired power plants, not fewer. It's a boomerang effect. The harder we throw energy into the grid, the harder demand comes around and hits us on the head. Solar cells are just another way of throwing harder. In fact, the history of energy in this country is very much a story about attempts to throw harder. Attempts to fill that leaky, expanding bucket. Long ago, whale oil was used for illumination. It was considered to be clean, cheap, and limitless. I mean, one whale might contain three tons of oil. So we poured that into the leaky bucket. Eventually, it wasn't as easy to find whales, and they were no longer as cheap as they were before, and people needed more energy. 
But oil drillers had found something even better to pour in the bucket. Their petroleum products were cheap, and they were certainly a lot cleaner than whale oil. And as any oilman can tell you, they were limitless. Well, eventually that story didn't pan out to be all that it was cracked up to be. And it turns out that somehow a lot of our oil ended up over in the Middle East. We still needed more power for the leaky bucket. But physicists had found an alternative. Nuclear power had no side effects, at least none of any consequence. It was cheap, clean, and limitless. Well, it turned out not to be the whole story either. But the bucket was still leaking and really growing now, which brings us to the next. Now there are solutions to stop the boomerang effect. There are solutions to lower coal demand, and we'll consider those soon. But first I have some questions for you about this bucket. What amount of solar energy would fill the bucket? Would this much do it? What if we doubled or tripled solar cell production in the United States? I mean, it'd be a lot of money, but we could probably do it. Would that be enough? What if we multiply solar cells by 100, which incidentally would bankrupt the federal government, and then we add in 10,000 utility-scale wind turbines? Would that fill the bucket? Or will it fuel the bucket's growth and make us even more reliant on coal and other fossil fuels? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't pretend to know the answers to these questions. I'm just a mem another member of the search party. And I'm also not claiming that the solar cells are some sort of conspiracy or hoax. But it certainly seems that there are a lot of unanswered questions. In fact, it seems that there are a lot of unasked questions. Yet if nobody manufactured a hoax, then how was the effect of a hoax created? And I think we have part of the answer right in this room. So where were we? I think some of you thought I forgot, but I didn't. We were in a room with a view of the ocean and unlimited, unlimited coffee on the other side. Now, this box contains something physical and something conceptual. Uh, the physical contents are worthless, as I mentioned before. It's just magazines. But there's something conceptual in this box as well. There's something seductive in this box. Our dedicated researchers had gathered the participants around the table, and they spread out this assortment of magazines, and they requested that the participants assemble them into collages, depicting what they thought of energy and its future, wide open. There were no cost-benefit analyses. No calculations, no research, just glue sticks and scissors. And they went to work. And the resulting collages that they built are intriguing. They're telling. But not for what they contained, for what they didn't. They didn't dwell on the major leaks in our bucket. Things like energy efficiency, insulation, suburban sprawl. They didn't address the factors that are causing this bucket to grow. Population, consumption, capitalism. They instead pasted together images of wind turbines, solar cells, biofuels, and electric cars. When they couldn't find clippings, they asked to draw. Dams, wave power systems, even animal power. They eagerly cobbled together fantastic totems to a gleaming future of power production. And as a society, we have done the same. Perhaps it's all too easy for us to miss the limitations of solar cells as we drop to the, our knees at the foot of this clean energy spectacle. The, spe the spectacle has become a divine deity 
where we chant objectives without always reflecting upon fundamental goals. And this oracle conveys a ready-made creed of ideals, objectives, concepts that are convenient to recite. And so these handy notions inevitably, inevitably become the content of environmental discourse. Now in a process of self-fashioning, environmentalists offer their arms to the productivist artist to embroider solar into the flesh of the movement. Solar cells have come to define what it means to be an environmentalist. And environmentalists are not the only ones lining up for ink. Every news article, environmental protest, congressional committee hearing, bumper sticker creates the occasion for the visibility of solar cells, wind power, and other productivist technologies. Numerous actors draw upon these moments of visibility to articulate paths for these technologies to follow. Many groups draw upon clean energy to attract support. Then they roughly sculpt energy options into more appealing promises. Next, lobbyists, strategic planners, and PR teams transfer the promises into legislative and legal frameworks, not through experimentation, but by planning, rehearsing, and staging demonstrations. These eventually become necessities for engineers to pursue. Now a consequence of this visibility making is the necessary invisibility of other options. There's only so much room on the stage, and I'll show you what I mean. From 2003 to 2008, gas prices shot up. And when they did, I stayed, I stayed um, safely in the library. <laughs> I wondered how would media frame the energy shock. I studied a data set of 50,000 articles written on energy over those years, and for every doubling of oil prices, coverage of solar, wind, and biofuels shot up 300%. But I also looked at energy reduction strategies, home insulation, light rail, LED bulbs. We've witnessed the impressive payoff of these strategies, and so we might expect that they are also given a lot of media attention. Here's what the coverage looked like. And this was not just a media phenomenon. Does anyone recognize this building? It's pretty far from here. This is a green building in Chicago's Millennium Park. Now, to be a green building, the architects might have super insulated this building, but they didn't. They used glass, allowing the building to bake in the summer and lose heat in the winter. They might have outfitted the building with LED lights, but I can tell you they didn't. I checked. <laughs> they might have incorporated overhangs to block the high summer sun, but allow the low winter sun to shine in. They might have used light shelves to toss more light into the building's interior but they did none of these things. This building is a green building because it has solar cells. The California Academy of Sciences building has solar cells in one of the foggiest microclimates on Earth. <laughs> the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has solar cells that are partly shaded by the structure itself. This BP station has solar cells. Some don't even face the sun. Here's the MLK Berkeley Student Union just around the corner. The building is not in an ideal latitude strip. It does not have LD LED lighting. And the solar cells also don't face the sun. In fact, none of these buildings have solar cells that face the sun. But you see, that doesn't really matter. The architects were not building buildings that were energy efficient. The architects were not building structures to reduce coal use. They were building temples. Temples to solar energy. Temples to technology. Temples to the idea that the way to solve our energy problems is to create more energy. Now consider for a moment that solar, solar energy, solar power, were a puppy. Maybe a chihuahua, maybe a furball like this one. If solar energy were a puppy, this is what I imagine it might look like. <laughs> Not real big, 
Not real smart, but super cute. <laughs> a puppy happily trotting along with all of society's dog walkers. Now the academic dog walker, who we well know, likes solar because solar walks bring benefits such as recognition and money. Industry likes walking solar as well because it offers tax breaks, production opportunities, and good public relations for the company. Government enjoys being out with solar as well. The public sees government in a good light for walking solar. And when elections come around, all the more reason to take solar out for a stroll. Media likes solar too. Solar offers exciting graphics, news stories, and segments people will watch which brings in more advertising dollars. And public, of course, is always out on the walks with solar. Solar makes public feel happy, responsible, and successful in combating environmental challenges. Sometimes being just a puppy, solar gets tired. But there's always someone around to pick up solar and keep going. For USTS folks in the crowd, uh, the dog is the boundary object which is why it's a Shih Tzu Terrier mix. <laughs> so on walks with solar, the various dog walkers all get along fairly well. Their interest in a happy and healthy puppy generally run in parallel, more or less, making these walks a friendly outing even if all they do is go to the park and walk in circles. Now let's consider the walk with energy reduction. Reduction is a huge dog with lots of potential, as we have seen. Though walks with reduction differ from walks with solar, reduction's walks include many more stops to pee. <laughs> Academia likes reduction and gets some government funding for going these walks. Uh, industry, on the other hand, sees reduction as more of a nuisance, sometimes saving money, but more often getting caught up in regulations along the way. And usually there's some bickering between industry and government, but they usually work things out since government doesn't have much to gain here. Government's constituents don't pay much attention to reduction. Media finds the walks with reduction to be tiresome. Not much news here. Public agrees, seeing the walks with reduction as a decrease in living standards. And why go for walks with reduction when the walks with solar are so much more fun? As educators and researchers, we need to understand how to organize more walks with reduction that interest more of the dog walkers. And I suspect that's going to be a lot more fun than you might think. Now, if you want people to do something, you have to appeal to their interests. Take junk mail, for instance. The junk mail industry claims 100 million trees every year, which processors must grow, cut, haul, process, roll, print, ship to homes, where they eventually, or usually immediately, thrown away, hauled, processed, and finally dumped. It's difficult to tally the total energy bill for this cycle, but one study equates it to 11 coal-fired power plants running continuously at full tilt. And this all goes towards something that most people don't even like. Here's what they did in Germany. They created this little sticker that says, no thanks to junk mail. I've got one right here. When the mail carrier sees this sticker, they return the junk mail to sender. In the United States, these stickers would patch a small hole in the bucket. And you might think, it's no big deal, it's just junk mail. And maybe you'd be right, maybe it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But in fact, this sticker would have a greater CO2 impact than all of the nation's solar cells existing and planned combined. Now we've already looked at another way to appeal to people's interests, making buildings more comfortable with passive solar. And I have one more that has to do with buildings. In 1974, this, the Federal Trade Commission required refrigerators to carry an energy consumption label for the first time. Now even though humans are very poor judges of short and long-term value, 
The savings in this case were so patently obvious that consumers flocked to the more efficient models. Today, refrigerators are 80% more efficient and cheaper too. If refrigerators still operated at 1974 efficiency, we'd need an extra 30 power plants running around the clock to cover the difference. Never underestimate the value of a sticker. Now think what would happen if you labeled the whole building. When you went to buy or rent a house, you'd be able to compare stickers like this one. Buildings account for more energy use than all cars, airplanes, trucks, buses, and trains combined. Now we're talking about some changes that could really plug some holes in that bucket. Now, none of these strategies leads to lower standards of living. Just the opposite, actually. None of these proposals cost much money. And while they are not technologically based, they rely on the same foundations, human ingenuity and creativity. I'd like to conclude by talking about this shift in focus from energy reduction or energy production to one of energy reduction contexts. Today, executives his silver-tongued fairy tales about clean coal technologies, safe nuclear reactors, and renewable sources such as solar, wind, and biofuels to pour into the leaky bucket. They foster the impression that we can maintain our expanding pattern of energy consumption without consequence. And at the same time, they claim that these technologies can be made environmentally and socially sound while ignoring a history that has repeatedly shown otherwise. But if we put down our clean energy pom-poms for a moment, we'll be able to see that every power production strategy has its own side effects and limitations. And using new forms of power simply means that we'll have to do, deal with new side effects and new limitations in the future. The real clean energy is less energy. But this is a shift in the way of thinking that is not available to many people. My client, for instance, thought he had to build a solar house. But he was unable to see that his shabby house with the two oak trees was already a solar house. Alternative energy fetishes have so greatly consumed the public imagination that the most vital and durable solutions remained overlooked and underfunded. But therein lies the opportunity for you. Inevitably, you will be asked to put solar cells on your home, in your research or design project, or in your community space. You may be expected to think of environmental solutions in terms of energy production. And when this happens, you might be willing to ask, if that's just a second best solution, or even a solution at all. Alternative energy technologies don't clean the air. They don't clean the water. They don't protect wildlife. They don't support human rights. They don't improve neighborhoods. Alternative energy technologies don't strengthen democracy. They don't regulate themselves. They don't lower atmospheric carbon dioxide. They don't reduce consumption. They don't stop the leaky bucket from growing. They produce power. That power can lead to durable benefits, but only given the appropriate context. Producing power is, therefore, not simply a story of inventors, scientific discoveries, and profits. It is a story of meetings metaphor, and human experience as well. And by keeping your eyes on re energy reduction contexts, you'll be better prepared than anyone else to address the rocky times ahead. As energy prices become more volatile, you will have the conceptual tools to make a difference. In fact, you'll find your skills and research will be sought after. They will become necessary. It's not a question of whether or not American society possesses the technological prowess to create an alternative energy nation. 
The real question is the reverse. Do we have a society capable of being powered by alternative energy? Now the answer to that question today is clearly no. The leaky bucket has too many leaks and it is still growing. But we can change that. Clean energy is less energy. The future of environmentalism will not be a story of solar cells, wind turbines, and biofuels. It will be a story of human rights, efficient communities, and effective governance. As educators, students, researchers, and global citizens, it is not enough to say that we would benefit by shifting our focus. Our future relevance may very well depend on it. Thank you.